First of all, I have worked for 40 years to create a sustainable world, and I have failed. The world is less sustainable today than when I started my hard work for sustainability in 1972. Secondly, I'm depressed because I've been given an impossible task, which is to take you out of your short-term local concerns, your job, your spouse, your money, and try to get you into a planetary perspective where you're concerned about abstract things like the long-term economic development of the world or the climate crisis. So uh, I assume uh, that the only thing I can do in order to help you make this uh, step, because I do not have the 10 minutes of small talk that it takes to shift you from short-term local concerns to the long-term planetary concerns, except uh, asking you to do it yourself and try to use this picture. This is essentially the planetary perspective of uh, my conversation. The third reason uh, why I am depressed is that I have actually spent time looking at the planetary future for the next 40 years, and what I see is ugly. We will not be doing all those things that we do know very well that we ought to have done. So that future does not look pretty. A couple of years ago, two years ago to be exact, uh, I sat down and decided that I would actually like to find out what will actually happen to the world over the next 40 years. Uh, I have spent much of my life giving advice to decision makers on what ought to happen in the future, like the talks we have heard this afternoon about uh, various attractive, plausible, reasonable policies that humanity ought to follow. Uh, and I, as I said, spent 40 years, and it hasn't worked. So I thought two years ago it would be interesting to sit down and try to find out what you know, all the decision makers, that means you, the voters, the government, corporations, actually are going to decide and what kind of future they are actually going to create uh, for uh, us. This task proved simpler than I thought. Uh, and the reason is that there is huge momentum in the, in the Earth system. You know, we are moving ahead uh, on a course which is not simple to bend. You know, it is like trying to, to shift uh, the course of, of the supertanker uh, on this uh, picture. As a result of my uh, pondering, uh, I, have no, I know fairly well what will actually happen over the next 40 years. And this is described in a book called 2052, which is a report to the Club of Rome, just like our 1972 book was, and has appeared over the last six months in a number of, of languages. Uh, the good thing about uh, trying to make this book at this point in time is that we have indeed acquired a, quite a bit of information over the last 40 years both hard data and actually quite a bit of soft knowledge about how the world actually functions. And possibly the most important thing we have learned over the last 40 years is how humanity actually makes decisions. You know, how the nation state typically pursues its short-term interest. How uh, capitalism and democracy actually pursues the short-term interest of the shareholder and the short-term interest uh, of the uh, voter. So that, in general, uh, society moves according to a fairly uh, near-term uh, uh, balancing. And the final thing we have learned is that society, luckily, do spend, does spend money on research and development, and as a consequence, there is technological advance. Based on this uh, type of, of considerations, I have made a forecast for what will actually happen over the next 40 years. It is not if, 
This is what will happen over the next 40 years. And let's start with the simplest thing. On the population side, okay, so this is the, uh, follow the red line, which is uh, the population uh, development. You will see that the world population will grow much more slowly than you, most people think. It will reach a peak in 2040 at 8 billion people and will be in decline in 2050. The reason for this is that the women of the world are going to choose to have much fewer babies in the future than they have had uh, than they have at this time. In the rich world, women will continue to choose a job rather than or a career, rather than more children. And in the poor, urbanized world, women will choose, when they live in the urban slums, to have much fewer children than they chose when they lived in the village. And the sum total of this dramatic fall in fertility will be a population which is actually declining already in 50, uh, 2050. If you look at the blue curve in the graph, this is the world production of goods and services. This is the world GDP. This is the world economy, which will also grow much more slowly over the next 40 years than most people think. And the reason here, this, so the world population in 2050, the world GDP in 2052 will be only twice as big as it is today, not four times as big as it would have been if economic growth continued at historical rates. Uh, the reason why the world economy will grow uh, so much more slowly is largely because of stagnation in the rich world. The rich world labor force will peak and then decline because the population is going down and the productivity, the output per worker, will also stop growing, largely because we have already moved the labor force from agriculture and industry, manufacturing and simple office work into the very difficult to make more effective uh, sectors of, of uh, service sectors and the social care sectors. So you will see that we will not be able to increase productivity and, as, and with a declining labor force, the GDP in the West will basically level off. There will be growth in the poorer parts of the world, primarily China and some of the emerging economies will expand tremendously over the next 40 years. Many of the poor countries, the 140 small and uh, largely poor countries at this time, will remain so. The sum of all of this is a world economy which is only going to be one half as big in 40 years as most people think. The effect of this is, of course, that there will be much more poverty in, in uh, 2050 than one would otherwise have had, both in the rich world and in the poor world. And the consumption growth over this period, will, the green curve will be further uh, reduced by the fact that we will have to spend quite a bit of labor and capital over the next 40 years on repairing climate damage and going after difficult resources, much more expensive resources than the ones that we are currently using. So, uh, the only good thing, as far as I can see in the future, is that the smaller, the much smaller economy will not need the large amount of energy and resources and water and food that most people expect. So there will not be any energy, resource, food or water crisis during this period, at least for those people that can pay the bill. So in summary, uh, economic and population growth on the small planet of ours will actually come to an end you know, within the next 40 years, not because of planetary uh, constraints, not because the planet is so small, but basically because women will choose to have fewer children than they had before, and the economists will not be capable of driving economic growth as fast as they uh, would like to. You know, the situ situation on the economy side resembles Europe over the last 10 to 15 years, where economists and politicians and everyone else has tried desperately to get economic growth going with no avail. But there is a huge but. So in spite of the small 
uh, economy, the small world, the small uh, economy and population of the 2050s, it is big enough to trigger a climate crisis. Emissions of CO2 and other climate gases that goes along with the economic expansion will accumulate in the atmosphere and will lead to uh, a peak in the CO2 emissions in 2030, and it only in 2050 will those emissions be down to the level that we currently have. We will not see the reduction in CO2 emissions of 50 to 80 percent, which is being pursued by the current negotiators. We will only see a cut of zero percent by 2050. And the reason for this decline is not that the negotiators will have achieved a result. It is basically because the economy will be leveling off and the population will be going down and technology will be advancing, increasing the energy efficiency and the climate efficiency of the economy. And consequently, we will be back to current emission rates in 2050. And this is the scary bit of my forecast. In other words, we will not do those things that are necessary and are easily doable, you know, to cut greenhouse gas emissions. We will actually let the temperature rise to roughly uh, 2 degrees uh, centigrade, and we will uh, incur increasing climate damage. Is plus 2 degrees centigrade in 2050 bad? The answer is yes. It basically means that over the next 40 years, uh, extreme weather events will become more and more frequent. That we will get more floods, more droughts, we will get more damage to the biodiversity, we will get uh, a slowly rising sea level during this period, which will make things complicated. And, uh, the, uh, yeah, and if that was not basically enough, if one looks further into the future, you will see that the temperature will not level off until 2080 when it will be at plus 3 degrees centigrade. And here science does not really know whether this is enough to melt the tundra. If it melts the tundra, we are in for probably self-reinforcing climate change in the ensuing 100 years. And I repeat, you know, this is really the sad part of my story, namely that we will decide not to act and consequently let loose a climate crisis on our children and grandchildren. And this we will do in spite of the fact that it's technically possible and not, not very expensive to actually solve the problem. And the cost of doing so is roughly a tax increase of 2%. So if every one of you accepted that 2% tax increase and all other rich people did so, that would actually solve the whole climate problem. We have gotten to the point where some of you have spouses and some of you have partners at home that will ask tomorrow, what the hell did he say? And so if this slide is in order to make it easy for you to tell what he said. Uh, he said that the world population and economy will grow more slowly towards 2052 than most people expect, but still fast enough to trigger a climate crisis. And he also said that consumption will stagnate because world society will have to spend ever more on repair and adaptation. There will be this, this was the average story of the world over the next 40 years. There will be huge regional differences, uh, which is illustrated in this graph, which shows after tax disposable income over time for five regions of the world. And let me just make two highlights. The top curve indicates the average income of Americans. Uh, which are the richest region, which is the richest region in the world. And you see rapid expansion over the last 40 years and stagnation and decline over the next 40 years. So the forecast basically is that the average American will be 10 to 15 percent poorer in 2050 than he or she is at this point in time. How is this possible? This is possible because the United States of America is the most mature economy on the surface of the earth and as a consequence has most of its people in the 
the soft, foggy type of jobs out on the, uh, the services and the social care industry. Their task is to increase the productivity of the women that are going to watch me in the old person's home in another couple of years, which is not easy to do. The second reason is, of course, that the United States does not have a system of governance which is capable of making rapid decisions. Uh, and, of course, the decisions that will need to be made over the next several decades are complex decisions involving income of in transfer of income you know, and wealth among income groups in the United States. This they won't do, and as a consequence, uh, there will be decline in the income level. The winner in the race is the red line. These are the Chinese. They will be five times as rich 40 years down the line as now. They will be essentially as rich as Europeans at the time. How is this possible? This is, of course, possible because of the perfect alignment between the interest of the majority of Chinese and the Communist Party of China. Both need very rapid and want very rapid income growth in order to uh, become happier, in order to create you know, heaven on earth in China for Chinese. And they will succeed. The poorest billion, the yellow line, will remain poor. They have doubled their income over the last 40 years from $1 a day in 1970 to $2 a day now, and they'll continue that growth rate and be at $4 a day in 2050. So we are facing a bleak prospect. And we know that the cost of doing something is actually only a 2% tax increase for all uh, industrial country people. So, won't someone do something? And the clear answer from the 2052 book is no. The challenge is very clear. You know, global society needs to spend money today in order to make life better for children and grandchildren 30 to 60 years down the line. We need to build electric cars at this point in time. We need to use the people that currently build electric cars to build fossil cars, that currently build fossil cars to build uh, electric cars, although those cars are a little more expensive. We need to use the people that currently build coal-fired utilities to build windmills and solar panels, in spite of those things being more uh, expensive. In short, Society needs to choose policies that are more expensive than the cheapest solution. So we have to stop being cost effective and start choosing the right policies which cost more than the cheapest solution. We need to make a sacrifice today in order to create a better world for our grandchildren. Some hope that capitalism, that markets will do the trick. The answer is no. Capitalism is designed in order to allocate capital to the most profitable project. That means to the cheapest solution. And that is exactly what we do not know, need at this point in time. We need to put more money into expensive solutions. Others hope that democratic parliaments will come in and regulate business in order to get perfect alignment between the business interest and the social interest. I say, good luck. We have tried for 20 years to put in a price on carbon emissions, you know, without any success. Parliaments have failed to regulate and will continue to fail to regulate because of lack of political support from, for regulations. Regulation normally costs a little bit more and Voters, in general, are not in favor of higher taxes, more expensive gasoline, or more expensive power. And consequently, democratic parliaments will not do anything significant. Finally, some people think that democratic society is going to decide to modify capitalism and democracy. I don't think they will. So, we have a fundamental uh, problem. We have the short-term nature of man reflected in our pet institutions, which are capitalism and democracy, into a short-term focus which locks us onto a global path which takes us directly to a climate crisis. 
The ironic thing is that this pervasive short-term nature of global society is exactly what, it makes it what makes it possible for me to be absolutely sure that my forecast is correct. So the short-term nature, the fact that everyone is going to choose the short-term cheapest solution is actually going to create uh, my future. What to do? What should you do about this? You should start by being in favor of the extraordinary efforts that is necessary if one wants to stop climate change. So these are the strong, extraordinary things that are not included in my forecast because I don't think they will happen. But you should be in favor of those. And you should be aware that the simplest actions that this mean is that you would be in favor of one child per family, in, first in the rich world, a ban on coal, oil and gas, first in the rich world, and then a huge effort to build low carbon energy systems in the poor world, paid for by the rich. And in practical terms, this ba or in political terms, this basically means that you should be in favor of higher taxes and stronger government in the climate area. In short, again, it means that you should be in favor of a sacrifice today in order to make life better for your children and my grandchildren uh, 30 to 60 years into the future. If you feel this is too abstract, I have an advice. Buy 10 tons of carbon every year in the European quota market and burn them in front of the Christmas tree along with the children who will benefit from all those cuts that will be generated by the higher quota price, which will arise if all of you do this. This will only cost you $40 per year. And if everyone did this, if everyone in Europe did this, it would actually save the world and make my forecast wrong. Thank you very much.